Hello. If you're watching this video, then you probably work for a gallery, library, archive or museum, or at least in an institution that has shelving a bit like this, or at the very least, has boxes a bit like this. Inside these boxes are sound recordings on all sorts of different formats. And this video and these training sessions are designed to give you an idea of what these formats are, what the differences are between them, how at risk they are, and how you ought to go about preserving them for the long term. So let's have a look at see what's in this box and how we can go about preserving the recordings in it. These are some of the formats that we have in our collections and that we deal with. So for example, we've got old discs. Is this shellac? Is it acetate? Is it lacquer? Here's another one. How rare do we think this is? How at risk is it? As well as discs, we have CDs. This is a black CDR. How do we know what's on it? Should we be worried about this? This is a commercial shop bought CD. Is this at risk? Tapes. Here's an old cassette tape. Does anyone know what that is? It's tape, but it's not a cassette tape. And here's another little thing in a plastic box. What's that? And here we have reel-to-reel -reel tape. Is this at risk? And what's this? Ooh. I might have to be careful with this one. Again, how at risk is this? And finally, what looks like a videotape. Could that have sound on it? There are issues with all these formats. Some are more at risk than others, and that's what we're going to cover in today's training session. Welcome guys, I'm uh, Richard Wilbank, the audio preservation engineer for Unlocking Our Sound Heritage based in Leicester University. So within this session, um, I'm going to give, give an overview of an introduction to audio formats, identifying what formats are at risk, and a sort of rough guide to what we do, um, how we digitise audio and considerations that you might want to think about there might be a possibility that you could actually digitize um, items in collections within your institutions so what's in your archive um, the most at risk formats are magnetic tape lacquer discs recordable cds and mini discs and this is due to two factors of the actual medium breaking down. So magnetic tape is um, degrading, same with lacquer discs and obsolescence of machines. So mini discs, um, the, the, the actual uh, players are, are extremely rare now, proprietary software and obsolete. It's also sort of the case with magnetic tape as well as that the machines are, are, are rare. There, there's not, there isn't really any any current companies still making magnetic like some like and real tape machines so that's a, that's a consideration as well so i'll start off with analog formats i'm going to go through analog formats basically in sort of date order when they're introduced and highlight which which are at risk and considerations about the actual audio content as well. So, in 1886, the, the basically the wax cylinder was introduced, um, and it's it's cut on a lathe, basically in a in a sort of hill, hill and dale pattern, which you can see in that um, in this circle here, this picture. And there's various types of materials used actually within the construction of them. The, really the earliest, the, the earliest actually data sort is the brown um, solid wax, which is sort of like a metallic soap. And wax cylinder really comes from the fact that it, it actually used to contain some beeswax in the manufacturing process. There were commercially um, pressed, mass produced uh, wax cylinders 
and they were basically um, hard black um, metallic soap discs, amber roll black celluloid uh, um, cylinders, and blue amber roll, which are they're of, of blue colour. And they vary between two minutes and four minutes in duration. So really, any anything on um, brown wax is going to be a, a unique recording. So it, it would have been used as an early type of um, dictation and things like that. Your, your blue amber roll and your your more robust solid black um, black amber roll uh, cylinders. So they, they the black amber roll was introduced in 1908 and uh, the blue amber roll 1913. They're going to be basically mass produced things. Not saying that they're not of interest. Um, there might already be copies that have been digitised in other institutions. You may have something that was commercially released, but is extremely rare and might, it might be the only existing copy. So it's definitely worth investigating. Handling wise, they're, um, they're pretty fragile. You have to basically pick them up with two fingers on the inside, just, to, just like that. And store them vertically as well. Don't, don't leave them on the side because they can actually distort. So it can go egg shaped basically, which is um, quite problematic for the uh, course for the actual transfer process. Another another consideration is the um, the actual grooves, um, it, the actual outer grooves are susceptible to to mould, and that can be really problematic because um, mould actually etches the soft sort of waxy surface. So, 1887, the gramophone was introduced, and these are a, a mono. It's a mono cut groove, and as you can see here, is the actual waveform of the signal. That's a mono signal on the top surface of the lacquer, uh, shellac disc. And most of these are commercially pressed as well from a stamper, and made of. Um, mineral powders such as lime, slate, dust, etc., bound together with like a, an organic polymer glue. And in the early days, it was from the, the lac beetle, so hence the, the name shellac disc. Yet again, these, are, these aren't really at risk. Um, they are pretty stable. They need to be stored vertically, um, just as you would with tapes and other other media as well so never never lie anything really flat with any other um anything else stacked up on top as well because that can cause um warping and things like that yeah again potentially these these are pretty stable these, these can live happily in the archive for a while there's potentially not going to be anything um uh unique on there but as I said, it's always worth investigating what, what you have got because you could have the only existing copy of, of something of a commercial pressing. So in 1929, um, the instantaneous disc was sort of introduced and these were um, sort of uh, they were made in public recording booths, sort of like sound postcards. You could send that these were adopted in the Second World War as well. And GIs would record a message and send it home. And these are uh, basically a hill and dale as well. So it's an up and down etched um, sound recording. These are pretty stable. And as I said, these are going to actually contain unique sound um, recordings. So they, they are definitely of interest, but they are stable, so they can wait a bit of time really for, for digitization. Yeah, again, with storage, um, store, store these um, vertically and nothing, never um, laid flat with anything on top. So, 
coming on from the instantaneous disc in 1934, the lacquer disc was introduced. And these are um, basically it's a it's a coating on top of a base disc material, which is aluminium. So it's an aluminium disc with a coating of um, usually cellulose nitrate. So a, a black soft material that these audio information can be um, scribed into the top surface. And these are definitely going to contain unique recordings. As you can see here, um, from, from the information on the labels that they're handwritten, indicating um, what the unique recording was actually uh, uh, recorded on them. Also, a good identifier is these extra these extra holes, and these are basically drive sprocket holes for the actual cutting lathe platter, just so the the, the pressure of the cutting needle didn't let the disc like, slip backwards, basically. But it's not not the case at all, as this one doesn't have that. The lacquer's instantaneous disc is actually used still still up to today in the um, modern vinyl um, production process where they they used to cut a master and then a, a a basically a metal plated stamper is made of the original lacquer disc the actual um within well within the second world war because of sources of materials um you can actually come across the aluminium was a shortage, so um, glass and card were used for the base discs, and they're extreme. Well, with glass, they're extremely fragile, um, and they're, they're known to break just without really any pressure on them at all. So, hand, you really handle with care when you're exploring what, what's in your archive. A good way to actually tell. Um, Get an idea, rough idea of what the actual base uh, disc is made of is you can look through the actual sensor spindle hole and you should actually be able to see that it's um, aluminium so there will be a, um, a chance to have a look and see the cross section of materials used in the construction also um, the actual uh, nitro cellulose nitrate wasn't the only material used of the actual um, lacquer, lacquer coating. Gelatin was also used as well. Um, and I'll just move on to the next slide and show you the degradate, the, how, how these um, degrade differently. So this is um, an example of plasticizer extrusion. So it's ex extruded palmatic and ceric acid. So it's, it's basically dirt turned waxy, and the, the the actual construction is extruded and and contracted. So the splits and just waxy deposits of basic chemicals. Really, it's it's all separated. You can see that the parts are chipped off, and the, the actual aluminium disc is exposed. And this is just there's no no remedial action or anything you can really take. That's this is just going to happen because of the chemical makeup and the duration, you know, the, the, the lifespan of the, the medium. So there's no going back from this really. It's, it's happening as we speak. Then just surface contraction as well. Um, so this is this is just as just as dramatic, but in a different way that the, the actual um, the lacquer is contracted on top of the, the base disc as well and peeled off. Yeah, again, there's, there's nothing you can really do about this. It's, it's happening. Now, th this is um, water damage on a gelatin disc. So this is sort of avoidable is that um, be, be careful with handling and um, moisture um, exposure as well. But once once the disc is damaged, there's yeah, there's no no real way of playing it. So 
actually 1935 um, magnetic tape recording was um, really took off, but um, there's been experiments, um, early experiments in magnetic recording in the 1890s. And in 1920, the BBC actually created a, a extremely large machine that recorded onto steel tape. Um, that never really took off, but the, the idea of magnetic recording on, on some sort of tape had been floating around, but it only really took off with a joint venture with um, AEG and BASF in Germany. Um, and in, in 1940, it was, it was adopted quite a bit just because of the, the sound, the sound quality. It was actually used to, um, uh, as a, as a, as a way of um, playing recordings and actually causing confusion about his actual whereabouts and things because we, because just because of the quality of the audio recording, people actually thought it was a, um, it appeared to people listening in as a, a live broadcast, but it wasn't. So, um, because it's such high quality and, and things like that, by 1944, when, when GIs and other forces had got hold of these tape machines, realised the, the actual quality of recordings and stuff, and then um, it was shipped back to the US, and there was a, a venture with a, a, a few soldiers and Bing Crosby, and that's how the Ampex company was basically founded. They, um, they just reverse engineered and... Uh, Saw the potential of the, you know, the quality in the recordings and stuff, and, and the commercial potential of it. So, this is just a, a representation of how a how a recording head uh, actually works. So you can see the tape moves in one direction. And it, and it basically aligns the magnetic particles in this oxide layer. And this, this photo on the, on your right, um, actually shows it's a, this is a magnetic tape viewer. So it shows the magnetic fields, um, on the tape via a, basically two bits of glass and a, a oily, um, solution in there with part of uh, no, with um, steel particles. And it's a really nice picture because it actually shows the magnetic field. And this is a basically a two track recording. Um, so it's, it's basically dual mono. So you play the tape in one direction and that's one, could be one oral history. And then you flip the tape over and you play it in the other direction. And that's your, that's your side one and side two basically. Um, tape, magnetic tape comes in quite a variety of different um, different track configurations and things like that. So it's always worth looking at the box for metadata and things on um, on track configuration. So this is this is the basically what what magnetic tape is made up of. So there's, there's always an oxide layer and the base layer and the oxide layer is usually this, um, it, it, that's the, that's where the magnetic information is recorded and the base layer is basically a, a structure to hold that onto. Um, not all tapes have a black back coating and that was introduced later on um, to combat um, yeah, to, to hold a, a lubricant and to combat um, print through and things like that. So the ferric oxide is usually standard, but the, the actual base layer can vary from early on. It was introduced introduction. Um, it, it, paper in the in the second world war was used. Um, acetate followed. And polyester and PVC um, later on. So polyester was introduced. So, uh, so in the thirties, acetate was in, um, introduced and was phased out around the sixties onwards. And this is an example of polyester tape and 
acetate. So in the centre, acetate tape can be seen, and that's that's transparent. And on the outside is um, a, just a standard post sixty sort of um, polyester PVC tape. Now, magnetic tape is is at risk, and it more than likely will contain a um, a unique recording because it's because it's because it's it is recordable quite easily. So the way um, magnetic tape can break down is with acetate tape. Um, it can it can shrink. It, it can curl and become brittle. Um, acetic acid also like gives off a vinegar smell, so that's when it breaks down. You can actually smell the tape, and um, it, when it's degrading, and it will smell a bit like vinegar. Um, I think, as I said, they can become brittle and snap, which is which is problematic. It can be sort of nice for a transfer where you use splicing tape to repair um, breaks. But if they're really bad, it can become um, virtually impossible due to the, the, the amount of breaks. And um, it's just impossible to, to stitch little bits to back together. And polyester tape, um, that, that breaks down in a different way that can it can actually take on moisture, so the um, it takes on moisture, and the oxide layer basically becomes sticky, and it's known as sticky shed strip syndrome. Um, there's various things that can cause it. It's not just the fact that the moisture content's taken on throughout um, from the atmosphere, but just chemically the tape can break down as well. So a tape could be stored in perfect conditions, but just because of the, the batch it was made from, um, it will break down and become sticky. And when you put it on a tape machine to play, when the tape moves over the tape head, it just deposits um, like a, a brown waxy substance, and friction builds up and the, the tape will squeak and it will, it will basically stop the tape machine from playing. Also you lose high frequencies as well because the, because the actual surface of the tape head is getting basically caked in in the, the material buildup. Um, one thing that you, you could do with your tapes in your archive immediately is, is, is um, look at the packaging of the tapes that are stored in. And usually uh, tapes originally came in a, a in a plastic bag, which is which was only really used for for when tapes were brand new and being shipped basically it was, it was something to stabilize the atmosphere then so they're never designed really to be live in a plastic bag for any length of time other than the time that they've, they've manufactured to be um shipping to a, a, a store so really this should so if any tapes being stored in a plastic bag take the tape out of the bag and throw it away because the plastic bags can either off gas and affect the tape or actually hold moisture within the bag so you've got high risk of mold and things like that and the uh, um, sticky shed syndrome as well so that's highly recommended remove all um, remove tapes from plastic bags and just let them live in their, their original cardboard box right so 1945 um, the uh, magnetic wire recorder was introduced, and this is quite a rare machine, um, and only really was used in the in, in America as a as a, a, a fancy dictation dictaphone, basically a dictation machine. Not really widely adopted anywhere else. Um, the wire is um, can be nickel coated carbon steel and it can that can corrode and break easily um, there's also uh, the fact that you've got to handle them with care so, it, so it's, a, it's a metal thing but um, if the if the actual wire comes off off the spool 
it's extremely hard, virtually impossible to actually re-spool and, and get the, the actual wire back onto the spool. So that's something to um, think about if, if, if you have got any wire um, recordings in your archive, just, just handle with care. If, um, yeah, if, it, if the wire comes off the spool, it, yeah, it's virtually impossible to get back on. The, um, so these, these are at risk because of the fact that the, um, the, the obsolescence of the machines, they're very finickety really. Um, if, if, if the wire snaps, there's no real way of splicing it back together. You actually have to tie, you lose a bit of information. You have to actually tie a, a special knot um, in the wire. So you're taking, you're taking up a bit of the recording space just by creating a knot, tying it back together. Um, so there's not many really, um, there won't be many of these machines actually in the UK that are in a condition to actually play a wire recording properly from start to finish. There's probably one at the British Library and um, probably, I, I guess, a handful within private private hands in the UK. So there, might, there might be an enthusiast out there that's managed to get one running nicely. These are, as I said, it, it will, there will be unique recordings on it. So there might be, if you do have any wire recordings in the archive, um, could be of interest, but because it's a metal metal wire on a on a real, um, the actual medium isn't at, at risk, but the, the obsolescence of the machines is. So that's a, that's a massive con consideration in um, the uh, driving force and getting it actually digitized sooner than later. So in 1948, the microgroove disc vinyl record was introduced. And that was by CBS. Um, and that was the um, basically the, the 33 RPM LP. And then in 1949, the seven inch uh, 45 single and EP disc was introduced. Now this is um, a, a stable format. It's a mass produced um, it's a you know commercial commercially pressed. Um, it's worth scoping out if, if you have got any vinyl records in your in your in your archives, because yet again you might have something where it is an, an extremely rare um, recording of interest. But the the, the actual um, records, there's no actual uh, player obsolescence. There's there's millions of really good quality record. Um, decks out there that you can play these easily on and the, the format is um, is extremely stable so the final record would happily live in it in, it, in a nice in its original dust sheet um, on an arc in an archive store standing upright um, for years and years to come they're, they're definitely stable and not at risk So in 1963, the compact cassette was introduced and it's basically a, a shrunken down um, pair of reel-to-reel uh, -reel, uh, reels within a cassette shell. Um, so they're developed by Philips in 1963. The sound quality, there was an introduction with Dolby Laboratories where they made a noise reduction and that was introduced in the, in the 70s. And there's, there's four types of um, cassettes that you'll come across uh, that, that were ma manufactured. And this is type one, so that's the most common type. Uh, this is a ferrochrome type two, which is, sorry, uh, this is a um, chrome tape which is very common and it's um, distinguished by these two tabs here and that tells the machine that it's uh, a, a chrome tape. This is ferrochrome and they're pretty rare, they, you won't really come across them. And then this top one's metal and that's distinguished by these two extra tabs in the middle as well on top of what the, the um, chrome tape's got. 
you'll share these these tabs and if you don't know these are right protection um tabs so what you could do is is just as a um just a bit of a precaution is if you've got any tapes in your archive you can just pop these out and then you know that it's it is absolutely impossible for anyone to really put these in a machine and accidentally press prep play and record and wipe any recordings on there that's a nice nice um nice easy um, thing you can do within your office just snap them all out with a with a biro or a little mini screwdriver um as for digitization and, and sort of scope of for getting that done you can you can um the, the tapes came in different durations and the physical size of the cassette is fixed but what what was done is the tape was made thinner to accommodate more basically longer tapes so a c120 um it got extremely thinner tape can, compared to a bog standard c60 or c90 so the c60 has got um usually the thickness of tape is is quite good and they, they won't really um but, but like they're relatively stable you know magnetic tape wise but the longer the duration so c19 c120 is the tape's getting thinner so there's less material and there's, there's more likely to be issues with them breaking down also within the tape shell you've got a pressure pad and things like that um, that break down there's, there's you know screws and things that break down so these are um at risk but they are going to carry unique potentially unique recordings um, and just like open real tape yeah, it's worth getting these um, digitized as soon as possible luckily there is um there is a uh, good quality tape cassette decks out there to, to transfer on but during during the duration of this project for the past um two and a half years we've been looking at other tape machines and become cassette machines and becoming rarer and rarer but ones that are in good condition and, and more expensive as well and it is a basically a case of um it's a minefield and the only out place that's really uh, selling raw cast, cast quality cassette decks is on, on on ebay so it is a bit of a minefield right i'll move on to digital audio formats now and run you through a brief history of them so i'll just I'll just quickly go over digital audio um that just give it because i'll be referring to sample rates and, and bit depths later on so this is a, a, a waveform and it's a representation of half a cycle waveform um in 16-bit 44.1 kilohertz so that's cd quality and it's pulse code modulation this is 24-bit 44.1 kilohertz and you can see that the the 24 bits is actually you can actually write more information really that's the actual volume of the of the audio and the sample rate is basically the, the actual how fine um how how, how high a frequency on the frequency you know spectrum it can record so this is 24 bit um, 96 kilohertz so you can see the, the it's actually the waveform sampled 96,000 times compared to this where it's 44.1 thousand times sampled a second and on on the digital scale um because it's it's a, a file um there's there's a maximum headroom really that you, there's a maximum amount of information that you, that you can record so the highest peaking volume is is zero and then it works backwards on a, um, a logarithmic de decibel scale with the quietest being infinity now I'll, I'll expand on that a little bit later on so 1977 um sony introduced a pcm pulse code modulation adapter basically to record 
uh, digital audio in either 14 bit or 16 bit audio um, onto, onto either VHS or Betamax. So this is a Betamax tape and this is VHS. Um, because these are tapes, these are, they're, they're breaking down just as any magnetic tape is now. Um, also, you've, also, you've also got the, the, rare, the obsolescence of the, um, basically the Sanley encoder that can read and write the digital audio on the, on the tapes. So they're doubly at risk really um, for the obsolescence and the fact that the tape's breaking down. So it's worth, worth looking in your archive. You might have some, some very early digital recordings. Um, so don't just assume a, a Betamax tape or a VHS is going to hold just purely video. You might have quite a special digital audio recording. So 1982, the compact disc CD was introduced. Um, that was a venture between Philips and Sony. And it's basically um, that's 44.1 kilohertz, 16 bit, two channel. And these are very stable. They're, they're stable format and they're, just, um, they're commercially produced press recordings. So they're, they're not going to be unique, but you might, again, you might have something where you've got a commercial disc that's um, the only one in existence now. So um, it's always worth looking into what, what you've got. Then in 1989, the CDR was introduced. This is a recordable um, disc. And these are extremely at risk um, for the fact these, these break down. Um, if I, you can see this is a comparison of a normal, um, normal compact disc. And this is a CDR recordable. So they've both got a polycarbonate plastic um, layer. But what, what's the difference between the, the CD and the CDR is that the CD's got a, an aluminium layer. So that's really stable. And that's where the, basically the peaks and troughs of the audio uh, or the digital information is kept. Um, So that's why CDs are, are they're quite robust audio CDs are compared to the recordable CD. Now this has a, a much thinner layer of basically a photosensitive dye. So the, um, the, the, the so CDRs are light sensitive. They're also sensitive to um, the packaging that they're kept in. So parts of packaging and um, pens that have been written on labels and stuff like that can off gas and degrade the, um, the CD, CDR as well. So they're extremely at risk and they, they are going to carry potentially unique oral, oral histories and things like that. So these are, these are top of your, these should be at the top of the list of um, digitizing and because um, uh, CDs are, uh, well, you can pop these into the computer, so they're, they're quite an easy thing to, to digitize them in the archive. So you, you can actually get on that straight away. But yeah, they, these are breaking down as, as we speak. So in 1987, the DAT digital audio tape was introduced. Um, and these are basically, they're like a, a, a VHS, the way that they're read with a helical um, scan. And it's where the, where the tape heads actually spinning. Um, but they're, these are actually smaller than a cassette tape. These are, these are at risk twofold because of the, the DAT machines were only ever really adopted by professional, um, the professional market. So sort of broadcast and radio and things like that. Um, and in commercial studios, which um, Sony tried to 
um, picked up and um, as, a, as like a high fi uh, on the commercial market, and it never really never took off. So the machines are extremely they're, they're rare, and they, there's just no real way of fixing them and things like that. So there's no spare parts. So there's machine obsolescence, and the fact that it is a very thin tape, um, so it's susceptible to mold and um, sticky shed breakdown, things things like that. It's worth um, reiterating again. All, all of these, it's best best. Um, Storing these vertically, never horizontally, with um, anything lying on top of them as well, just like any, all the other tapes and discs. So, 1992, the mini disc was introduced. <clears throat> so these were really popular within oral, oral history societies and, and things like that. So, these can hold unique recordings. That's, and um, these are actually the mini disc is stable. But the, the, the biggest problem is, is the proprietary software that Sony introduced, which was a, in a, an A-track format. Um, so there's no way of reverse engineering and reading these disks. Um, so that the, the implications of the um, mini disk players breaking down and being obsolete is, is a massive factor in um, the risk of these recordings contained on mini discs and the, these are highly at risk and worth um, digitizing as, as soon as possible. Um, the actual data on these is, is read by a laser, but it, instead of the sort of peaks and troughs, it's a it's a magnetic optical um, uh, method. So in 1993, um, MP, the MP3 file was introduced. So this is basically an end of physical carriers. And it's, it's basically the file based approach. Um, MP3, is it, what, what, what consideration is, is we're looking at is the, the fact that um, digital files and, and digital programs and stuff can become obsolete from the, the lack of um, support and things where other bits of software are updated so um, operating systems and things like that and um, some files formats can um, become uh, at risk because there's, there's no real way of playing them the, the software uh, is no no longer supported and things like that but um, mp3s are very, very, um, very stable and will be supported for a long time and the same with same with dot wav um, files. So I think we've, that was a lot of information to take on, and I think everyone would probably benefit from a cup of tea or something. So at this point, we'll just break for five minutes. Hi, I'm Richard, the digitization engineer. And when we conduct a condition survey, basically what we're doing is looking at the items within our collection and basically noting any um, anomalies, um, deterioration, um, dirt, mould, things like that that will impact on the actual longevity of the item and how it will be um, digitised um, and what to prioritise to digitise first. So with this with this um, shellac disc, we can actually there's, there's surface dirt and, and muck, but it isn't mould, so there will be a cleaning process involved with um, digitising this. So that can impact on the actual digitization time and things like that so that's also an important part of the condition survey is you can actually forecast um, what what processes need doing to digitize items um, and it just gives you a good idea of what things to do first as well with the condition survey we look at audio tapes as well and this open reel tape as you can see the would note that the pack is very loose and the, the tape is actually coming off the reel, so that, that needs attention. It just leaves it susceptible to distortion um, and, and mould as well, because the, the uneven pack, um, more likely a debris and moisture can actually take hold and uh, form mould there. This is an example of an open reel tape that is, is properly packed away, so it's basically been 
played and wound probably with the library wind because the pack is nice and tight it's also in very good condition very clean there's no dust or anything and it's got the leader tape which is a, a good sign it protects the outside of the tape it's also a good addition because it's it gives an extra length of non-audio tape for the tape to nicely run in on so it's um just keeps it nice and clean and tidy this is an audio cassette tape and one thing to note is the actual foam pressure pad if that's loose and come off that tells you that adhesives and um, materials have actually broken down so it's a good indication that um, the tape won't play properly at, at all so what we would do is when it comes to digitization we would open the shell up and take the reels out and pop them into a brand new um, cassette tape and play it through that recordable cds are one of the most at risk formats that we actually tackle and this is a perfect example of something that would need digitizing straight away it's a recordable cd and it actually has um, pen written on on the top of the cd also there is actual discoloration within the um, top layer and these are basically photosensitive dye is what the information is written in so um, uv light damages them the actual off-gassing of the chemicals within the pen, off-gassing of actual the, the case as well can damage them. So these need digitizing straight away. So to summarize, a condition survey tells you what things need prioritizing and it gives you an idea of the duration and the cost involved with digitizing the collection. So in, in this um, in this section, I'll be uh, running through a bit of a guide to how to how we preserve um, collections and considerations that you might want to think about as well. And I've split it into sort of four sections: the preparation, mi migration, capture, and editing. So the preparation is is things like um, identifying the collection. Um, uh, Sort of the setup of the equipment and uh, migration is the actual sort of the, the setup of the equipment, but with in consideration with the computer as well. Capture is the recording, and editing is um, the file editing and, and storage and things like that. So, preparation wise, so in the video, we talked about condition survey. And it's extremely important to discover what, what's in your archive and what, what stage of um, deteriorations or items are in. Um, it's also worth uh, recording the actual metadata on the on the so along with the any paperwork for your collections, it's always worth um, looking at the uh, recording what, what what items you've got, any um, handwritten notes and things like that looking out for how loose, um, say like the, the tape pack is, um, and, and with all uh, the recordable CDs, whether, whether some, someone's actually written on them, if they're starting to discolor already, you can, you can actually identify them and pro prioritize um, your, your digitization um, items list. So it's always worth keeping um, like a, a spreadsheet, like a tracking tracking sheet, where you can track um, who's, who's catalogued an item, uh, information about the the items. Once once the item's digitised, what what machine um, was it was it digitised on? The, the file name of um, the audio that was uh, digitised, uh, things like that. That's extremely valuable to to keep all all information. Uh, mentioned as well like the, the metadata what's on the box sort of thing so with um with the condition survey you can actually gauge uh 
problems that you might encounter. So on, on this box, um, it's, a, it's a transfer of a, a, a cassette that was recorded in 1972. It's um, it's a mono tape, so side one, and then it continued the um, recording on side two. And this is really important. So it actually gives really useful information that it tells you the machine that the tape was originally recorded on. So it's a UR. So that you could actually research that and look into whether that tape had a a specific noise reduction um, setting or anything like that. What what speeds it it would play. That's one thing that isn't written on here is the tape speed. Um, and this. The date as well it says 4th of the 9th, 1987. So we know that the tape um, is, is most likely a, a mid 80s tape, and that's a good indication that it's going to be a, a poly, polyester tape and it could most likely be suffering from um, sticky shed, shed syndrome. The way that you could tell really is by um, you could take the tape out of the box and if you roll it. And let let a bit of uh, tape just gently um, release from the tape spool. If it appears like does it it's sticky, like as if the tape is um is static on the tape, um, and it's sticking together, that's an indication that there's sticky shed syndrome. That there's uh, a bit of um just just be a bit tacky. Cleaning the mould treatment, I'll do, just say that anything mouldy, always deal with it in a well ventilated, ideally outside um, area. And always wear, wear gloves and eye protection. Most importantly, a um, FFP3 rated dust mask. Um, that, that will actually filter mould particles. And it's pretty important because mould. Um, the exposure to mould, you don't ever build up a resilience, it just breaks your um, tolerance to mould down with each encounter. So the more frequently you come into contact with mould, the more it's going to actually affect you. So it's always best to make sure you've got a FFP3 dust mask. So with all the correct PPA, it's quite um, simple to, to deal with really. With um, with open reel tapes, you can brush the mould off, and if it's on the packaging as well, you can easily brush um, mould off with a soft brush um, in a nice ventilated area. And then finally, you could use 99% pure isopropyl alcohol um, to, to wipe any um, last remnants off. And it, that uh, really pure isopropyl alcohol is really good because it doesn't leave any any residues or anything so you can just um, apply that and wipe it away and it will evaporate and um, not affecting the tape i wouldn't recommend that for any any discs though this is just for audio tapes with with cassettes um it's a bit more difficult because you can't actually directly get um get to the reel so what we do is we use a we've got a sacrificial tape machine so we only use it really for mouldy tapes and um, you simply play and fast forward the tape and then you can apply a swab um, on the last pass sort of thing with um, isopropyl alcohol and just wipe it off but usually just um, fast forward and rewinding um, and then and then uh, cleaning the pressure pad on the on the cassette that usually uh, uh, gets rid of the, the mould. So I've mentioned baking. So basically, this this in theory dehydrates the tape, um, and you can you can actually do this yourselves really with a with a food dehydrator. Um, it, it can be quite expensive. Uh, food dehydrator around the 150 pounds mark sort of thing, but. Um, they're really good because you can get you can what we do is we use a complete food dehydrator set to um, 55 degrees centigrade and for 12 hours so it's quite um, time intensive so if you're getting an external company commercial company to um, digitize tapes and you've specified you've identified that they are 
the rule is breaking and or they've discovered that the rule is breaking it's it's adding a, another 12 hour process really to their um so you, you, you're increasing the uh the person hours so it's going to increase costs but this um this only really lasts so you could dehydrate the data tape and really they need um transferring within 48 hours really after after baking so we do an overnight process for 12 hours and then the the, the tapes uh, once i get in the tapes basically relax back to a nice um sort of archive room temperature sort of thing and the, and the play, you could play nicely but not all the time though so old old edits and um splices on tapes uh, the the adhesive usually breaks down so they um they need they'll need fixing good good way of identifying them and the good thing with open wheel tapes is to always before you actually um go to do size and play the tape is to is to fast forward and rewind the tape and that just repacks the tape and it takes that basically takes up the slack so you, you pop the tape on and fast forward it and this um it's usually just repacks the tape and it's uh it can avoid you have to be very careful though if um if the pack's really loose the tape machine can sometimes jump into action and you can get get to a point where it actually stretches the tape and that's a really really destructive um destructive thing to the tape because it, it actually stretches the time information and amplitude drops off as well so you have to be careful with how, how you go about that um but through the fast forward and rewinding uh, these these edits will break and you can just identify them and then add a bit of um, new splicing tape to fix them it's also worth adding leader tape as well so that just spans the gap of um the, the tape machine so when you press play uh the leader tape takes up the space so by the time the tape machine playhead gets to the actual audio tape the, the transport of the tape has had um it's had time to stabilize while it's been just running over the uh red leader tape so just gives it that time to stay with the machine to stabilize So with um with cassette cassette tapes as well you can you can bake them and that that's helpful but usually if the, if the tapes shared throughout its lifetime of actually being played and stuff it will deposit um an oxide layer around here and here and it, it basically that that will cause friction even if you you bake the tape so they will need rehousing in, in a basically a brand new cassette you, you pop one open, you remove the old reels, and then you put the your um, your baked reels into the into the shell. Um, yeah, and it's it's nice because the actual tape pack is is really nice and fresh, and the pressure pad is is new, and that that's uh, it's it's a fiddly job, but it, it works really well. So I'll move on to migration. So this is the equipment that's sort of used for um, actual digitizing the audio. So what we've got is a an analog to, to digital converter, and this this one's ours. It's bought by the British Library for the cost of over three thousand pounds. So it's it's um it's 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 really good. Uh, very clean low noise sort of preamps things like that but it's also got a feature where it does its own checksums where it will check the integrity of the file that's been recorded which is it's got its own software called verify so if the computer um audio recording software has any issues or glitches you can actually run a file afterwards and it will, it will diagnose where um on, along the timeline of the audio fort file where um, samples have been dropped, and that's been quite useful early on in the um, in our project because we have had stability issues with um, with the software that, that we use, and you can actually audibly hear the um, 
pops and clicks and clicks where, where samples have been dropped. Um, so that's a, that's a fancy, really useful bit of kit. kit, kit. But um, what you could use on a budget really is, is just a hundred pound to U44 USB digital analog converter. Um, you could actually still digitize and get some quite good re results with that sort of equipment. The one thing to think about, if I just look back, this actually has um, got variable gain. Uh, the inputs on this are for a fixed level. So there's not really room for adjustment, but with, with these, there is. So I'll sort of just talk about audio levels and gain and the fact that with your, your digital files, there's a maximum amount of information that you can actually record. So zero is the, the maximum information in the, um, in the audio file. What happens is if, you, if your audio signal exceeds that, it's going to clip and that ends up with um, a sort of distortion. So you can see the waveform should be nice and smooth, but then it's just been cut off basically because you've run out of information, run out of space for it to write the information. So understanding uh, audio um, digital meter is uh, quite important for transferring stuff. So this has got the, this indicates the red danger, zone of danger. So it says the maximum um, level is zero dB and then the scale works backwards, the log logarithmic decibel scale. So too low and your wanted audio, so your all history that you're transferring to the tape is, um, is going to be buried in basically virtually at the same volume as the noise floor of the um, recording device. So it would, be, it would be just as loud as the hiss and be masked by sort of hiss sound. So if you turn the gain up, it's best to, best to hover around, say, minus 20, minus 12, sort of around the minus 18 mark. Um, and that, that should give you enough headroom for any unexpected peeps. So it's always best to um, play, play, the, play the tape or, or whatever you're transferring and just spot check um, through various parts just that it doesn't change into sort of, you know, if there's a bit at the end of a concert or something with really loud clapping, is to make sure that doesn't click and things like that. So yeah, set your gain levels to that sort of... Um, minus 20 minus 12 sort of in the 18 area. So with, with tape machines, something that we do every every time we go to transfer the tape is we use isopropyl alcohol and a, and a cotton swab to actually clean the tape head. But we also individually adjust the azimuth. So that's the position of the um, that's the position of the tape playhead. Uh, on the machine and what we're doing is we adjust this to actually match the original position of the um, the original position of the, the, the record head on the original machine when the um, recording was made because as you can see this is a, a misaligned so these are the actual tracks so your left and right and that's your, your left and your right um, part on the actual um, playhead as you can see, the misaligned, so you lose high frequency information. The actual audio appears to be dull. So, if you've got a cassette deck, you can actually look at manufacturer specs and things like that and locate this azimuth screw um, and you, you can adjust that. So, with a bit of modification on most tape machines, cassette machines, you can uh, um, just drill a hole in the front and use a screwdriver and actually adjust this while, it, while the tape's playing and you can. You can actually hear the difference to when the tape head's properly aligned with the original information. Um, if you turn turn the azimuth screw one way, um, and if, if the sound gets duller, you know you're going in the wrong direction. So you just gently turn the other way, and the, um, you can rock it back and forth to get to actually listen out for where the where you're getting the most high high frequency, and it's not sounding sounding dull anymore. We, we do that every time with um, 
with the big open reel machines and, and with push -ups. I'll move on to the capture section. So digital audio workstations or doors. We use one called WaveLab Pro and that's it's basically because it was adopted by the British Library and it's, it's very useful for um, quick workflows with uh, basically copying files, renaming and editing. It's not the best thing for recording, hence we had issues with dropouts, you know, you know audio glitches um, early on in the project, but it seemed to be resolved. But the, the software is good for that sort of um, the editing side and non-destructive stuff. Uh, it's really good for that, which is very important for the project. Um, so th there are free uh, to use uh, workstations out there. I definitely re recommend um, Reaper by Kokos. Um, it's got some quite advanced features and things like that. Ex extremely good. Um, there's also Audacity, but that's uh, that's changing, and I think there's issues of you know, uh, collecting data and stuff. But it's worth doing research on what what bit of software you do use. So sample rating bit bit that the archival standard is 24 bit 96 kilohertz, unless born digital. So born digital is a um, a, a recordable CD and or DAT tape or mini disc that they're, they're at a lower sample rate but because they're recorded for born digital like that you can um, transfer and or rip a CD and you don't you don't have to match the 24 bit 96 kilohertz just leave it it's it, it's um 16 bit 48 kilohertz for a DAT tape that's um fine for the uh, archive like that so this just shows how a, an a, a audio um, uh, audio waveform and then how it is actually sampled um, PCM pulse code modulated. So there's again ampl amplitude and then sample over time. So as I mentioned the sample rate but the actual the most um, stable and forecast to be accessible audio format is um, dot .wave files, WAF files, um, so 24 bit 96 kilohertz wave files is um, is the archival standard. We also use MP3s for app copies as well. So storage wise, um, within the institution it's best to Best to keep backups on the cloud within within your on your servers and things like that. But it's also a good consideration to probably have a um, have a portable hard drive with with your collection as well in, in the, stored in the archive, just just in case there's any uh, any compromise with with the with the institution servers. At least you've got one physical backup. Um, with the with the British Library, they they I think eventually stored once they've been migrated. It's on. It's stored with a company virtually on on uh, like a literally a nuclear bomb proof server sort of setup. But then them sort of services are, are quite expensive. So multiple hard drives as backups is probably a very efficient way, but ensuring that you've still got copies of the of the files. I'm moving to the editing stage. So editing wise, we usually um, we usually leave a second or two before the before modulation or before when we when our wanted audio is starting. So this leading would just be take take this and then the actual interview starts there. So yeah, one or two seconds is, is pretty pretty good. One thing to to um, one consideration when using um, digital audio workstations is that we all know computers can be funny and stuff and it's always doing worth doing pre-flight check sort of things of making sure that um no settings sort of like destination folders or the map 
or sample rates have changed. I've had it where um, the computers needed rebooting and, and settings have been lost and destination folders have been defaulted to some uh, to the C drive basically and things like that. So it's always good just to make sure things are going to um, it, things are being saved to where they should be and at the right correct matching sample rates that something isn't being converted along the way and it just, it just causes um, just a bit of a waste of time really and sometimes can be destructive. So file names are a good consideration as well and with our project the, the file names represent the, the item the, the collection, the item, institution, and the actual physical item itself. So with this, we've got the URL, so that's University of Leicester. And we've, we've given it the collection um, destination of URL 003. So that's the, the collection. So then it's item 34. Then the assumption for S1, F1, and V1. So S1 stands for um, side one for the tape, so that's side one of the tape, and file one and version one. So version wise, that could be if it was version two, say here, that could indicate that we used a we've done two two versions, two transfers, and it's um, one's with noise reduction and one's without because we didn't know the original setting. Um, side two, so that, that's identified with side two. Um, file two as well. That's that's good because you could you can use that to indicate where. So like this is a, a broadcast, open reel tape from a um, from a radio station. So on side one and file one, the first part was mono. So you can log that on your, on your tracking sheet that F one is a, a mono file, and then um, side one F two is the latter half of the tape went into an actual stereo play or something like that so you can you can identify that within your tracking sheet so yeah identifies the institutions and item and collection and represents the physical as well so that's it's a nice nice little setup so once you name your files um this is this is a really important thing is to, to actually do checksums uh, create checksums. So what what a checksum file is is um, is basically a hexadecimal representation of the information within your audio file. So it gives you a a, a very small um, file, extra file that's a reference to your um, uncorrupted, brand new master um, file that you've just you've just um, edited and named. So we use a, um, it's called Blackbush, made by the British Library. Um, basically, because you can do a lot of bulk stuff, but there's loads of free, free things to, uh, free, free checksum software out there that you could use. And this makes MD5 checksum files. So it's, so once you've, it's always best to set the destination of the MD5 file as well, uh, the, your checksum file alongside your audio file just so you can do um, comparisons so once these are made and they, these are on um, whatever your your digitization computer once you transfer all these files onto um, your institution a, a, a server or something or onto another computer or another hard drive you can actually run the software and the md5 file contains the information to tell you what um, what inf uh, the, the actual amount of information in this uh, original audio file. So if that's changed or corrupted, um, it, it's flagged by the fact that there'll be a difference from what the um, MD5 file uh, is recorded. So there's always a good, good point of reference to see, see, check for corruption and things like that. So we make access copies as well. So we, we always make MP3 access copies for um, any and for basic ease of use. Um, the fact that you're not using the original uh, master copies of stuff, and so easily these MP3 files 
easily um, shared online and stuff so easily with other people that are interested and especially with catalogers as well it's an easy um, format to deal with um, so catalogers will use mp3 access copies and it's just a smaller compressed file that's easier to share and host on the internet which is useful so i'll just run through some best practices uh, keep uh, tracking spreadsheets and record with their data. Re read equipment specs to optimise signal flow and just have a general understanding of the equipment and it makes fault finding a lot easier. Um, set the signal level to an average around minus 18 dB. Record at the um, archival standard of 24 bit 96 kilohertz WAV files unless the unless the um, item was born digital like a, like a CD, DAT tape and or mini disc. And create multiple backups with check and um, stored alongside with the checksum files as well. So make checksums and um, make multiple backups and you should be safe from any data corruption and loss. So I'll move on to the preservation strategy really. So scoping what formats do you have and what do you what what do they contain? That's extremely important. Um, it's just looking at your archive and because you if someone's deposited something with you, it's it's, it's going to be of interest anyway. And you've probably got some some gold within your collections. Are they any particularly relevant or important to your organisation? Or any imminent risk of failure? So. Do the condition survey of the tapes, discs, CDRs. Are there any copyright issues as well? We all know it's worth preserving recordings, but you may you may not be able to use them in public. Can you get clearance? Are there any resource impl impl implications? Are the cost issues? Can you digitise these yourself or? Well, you need to get someone else to do it. Advice is available on contracting out the work. Be sure on what you're agreeing to, process and format, formats wise. Because um, that you have to be quite specific with um, sort of commercial digitization companies. Have you a plan for long term storage of the digital files? And Digitization companies just mentioned that slightly earlier that research if you are going to go down that route research the company's previous work see what um, other institutions they've worked with and what what collections they've worked with as well and um, always provide them with any technical data um, so you, you might want to um, so so any technical data be clear on what you want them to do as well. So there might be some tapes where they have it's actually marked on the boxes and there's there's notes as well that a tape's been recorded with, with a specific Dolby noise reduction and um, it's worth specifying which tapes you, you want that applied to so they, they know and they won't just otherwise go blind even if it's marked on the cassette tape, it's marked on the item that they've got to digitise. So just if they're not asked to do it, they will just blindly um, play the tape without the noise reduction settings um, and, and get a quote and double check the proposed work so just make sure that what you've what you've specified is in the quote and included just to stop any um, mistakes and any back and forth where things have got to be redigitized by them because they'll, they'll do it at, at a cost Right then, so we've moved, that's, that's the end of that and um, we can move on to the questions section. <laughs>